I neglected last week, and offer my apologies, I had everybody come up to serve communion but neglected to tell you the um, languages they were serving in. Was that last week, two weeks ago? So I wanted to tell you, Amira was um, speaking Bosnian. Um, she was born in Bosnia, for people who don't know that. And uh, Angelica was speaking in Spanish. And Chandra, what? Who did I miss? Toby, Toby was speaking French, thank you Toby. And Chandra was speaking Tamil, right? Say it again, say it really loud. That's what she was speaking. <laughs> and we give thanks for that. It was really cool to see that. And um, not many churches have the people to be able to do that. And there were probably more languages that we could have used. So maybe next time we'll have like 15 people up here doing it. It was very, very fun. So thank you to everybody who helped with that. I invite you to read along with me. Our second scripture reading comes from the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 6, verses 4 through 6. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. Keep these words that I am commanding you today in your heart. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Holy God, we pray that you would speak your words to us this morning. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable unto you. For you, O Lord, are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So we begin this week a new sermon series called Reading the Bible for All It's Worth. And we wanted to do this series for a couple of reasons. In the um, last year, a study was put out by the Center for the Study of Religion and American Culture called The Bible in American Life. And in their um, study, they found that 50% of Americans read some form of scripture in the past year, which is actually pretty high, and that 48% of those people read the Bible. They said that four in five read at least once a month, and that 9% of Americans say they read the Bible daily. There were some really interesting pieces to this study. Like it's, um, The study found that women were more likely than men to read scripture, that older people were more likely than younger people, that southerners were more likely to read than those in any other um, region in, the, in America, and that African Americans were more likely to read than those of any other race. Nearly half of the 48% who do read the Bible on their own said that they turned most favorably to the book of Psalms, particularly noting Psalm 23, which begins, the Lord is my shepherd. Most of us could probably finish that sentence, right? And according to the survey, the report said that nearly 8 in 10 Americans regard the Bible as either the literal word of God or as, an ins as inspired by God. 50% of those who have not read the Bible still believe it to be the divinely inspired word of God which is even higher by four percentage points than the people who do read the Bible. When asked why they read the Bible, respondents named the number one reason as being personal prayer and devotion, and others said that they read it to learn more about their religion. So, we know that lots of people are reading the Bible, but we also know that there are lots of really big questions out there about Scripture. When I have somebody come to a Bible study for the first time, most of the time they will tell me I have never, they say it very, like, ashamed, I've never read the Bible all the way through, and I tell them, you are not alone. There are probably 90% of the congregation who would say that if we were to do our own survey. And part of that is because sometimes the Bible feels inaccessible. We don't know where to start, or we don't understand what we're reading, or we have questions and we don't know where to go for the answers. So our study is going to look, our sermon series is going to look at those big questions. Why do we read the Bible? What is the Bible? What do we mean when we call it scriptures? What makes it holy? How were they written? Who wrote them? What do we do with the really hard passages, the ones where uh, that seem to have God condoning violence or asking people to commit horrible things? Or how do we reconcile those stories in scripture with our science? scientific knowledge? How do we um, use the Old Testament and the New Testament together as one book? So over the next couple weeks, we're going to look at all of those questions. Today, my job is to talk about the Old Testament. And next week, Pastor Bill's going to talk about the New Testament. He got the better end of this deal. <laughs> Just so you know, when he comes next week and says, Pastor Church gave me the really hard one, that's not true this week. So before we dive into that, though, I want to say a word about the Bible in general. 
The Bible as we have it consists of the Old and New Testament, right? That's what the words that we use. The Old Testament is composed entirely of um, what some call the Hebrew scriptures because it is for the Jewish people their scriptures. The New Testament is composed of the story of Jesus Christ and the struggle and teachings of the early Christian community as they tried to figure out how to live into the things that Christ taught them and how to be the church. The word testament literally means covenant. So we have the old covenant and the new covenant. A covenant in scripture is the highest form of of agreement. It is the highest form of contract. It's an agreement between two parties where one party says they will do something and the second party says they will do something. So the old covenant was between God and the Jewish people. The new covenant that Jesus forges is between God and those who follow Christ regardless of their nationality. So taken as a whole, the Bible is the story of God and God's covenant people. It's the story of how God interacts with us and how humanity interacts with one another and with God. Now, there are some who believe that the Old Testament is just that, that it's old and outdated and it has been replaced by the New Testament. And that's by no means new thinking. It's um, been around for a long time. There was a guy called Marcion who lived in the second century, and he believed and taught that the God of the Old Testament couldn't possibly be the same God as the Father of Jesus in the New Testament. And his reasons were many of the same reasons that we hear today, that the Old Testament is filled with violence and wrath and judgment, but the New Testament is is about forgiveness and grace and love. And so Marcion believed and advocated that we needed to get rid of the entire Old Testament. He wanted to include in our scriptures only portions of the gospel and a few of Paul's letters in the Bible, but to get rid of everything else. Now, thankfully, after a lot of arguing, the church wisely disagreed with him and kept the Old Testament as part of our scripture for us. Unfortunately, that kind of thinking didn't end with Marcy, and he's not alone. There are many people today who think along the same lines, claiming that the Old Testament has little or nothing to teach us and that we should spend all of our time learning about Jesus and the New Testament. Now, here's, I think, what the problem is with that thinking. The only scriptures that Jesus had were the Old Testament scriptures. And he was familiar with them and relied on them and quoted them throughout his life and ministry, even while he was dying on the cross. When Jesus is tempted in the wilderness, he quotes three different passages from Deuteronomy as a way of resisting temptation. When he's asked what the greatest commandment is, he quotes our scripture passage from Deuteronomy this morning and pairs it with the passage from Leviticus. The first recorded sermon we have of Jesus's is based on a passage from Isaiah where Jesus says he is the fulfillment of that prophecy. And like I said, when Jesus is dying on the cross, it is the words of the psalm that he uses to give voice to his pain. Over and over again, Jesus turns to the words of the Old Testament. He often reinterprets them and breathes new life into them, but he doesn't dismiss them or question their value. Jesus' disciples and the earliest followers of Christ followed Jesus' lead on this. Even after Christ's death, they never advocated that we get rid of the Old Testament. They never suggested to the Jewish authorities that they were studying the wrong scriptures. They had a different understanding of how to interpret and apply those same scriptures to their lives, but they never advocated getting rid of what we now call the Old Testament. I think if we really want to understand Jesus and the writings of the New Testament, we have to have at least some familiarity with the Old Testament. So this morning, we're going to do a really broad and fast overview of the history of the Old Testament. This is going to be one of those times that you're thankful I talk as fast as I do, because we have about 1,400 years of history that we have to get through. So here we go. This is what I want you to do. I want you to pull out, there's red um, pew Bibles in your pew. If you don't have one of those, you can grab your own, but you're going to do work along with me this morning. So just grab it and hold it for a few minutes while we begin. So like I said, we call the first part of our scripture, of our Bible, the Old Testament. The more accurate name for it would be the Hebrew Bible or Hebrew scriptures. It consists of 39 books that were written over more than a thousand year period, from 1200 to 200 BC. Now the amazing thing about the Bible And I think the Hebrew Bible in particular is that it has all kinds of different literature in one book. Now, normally when you go to the library or Barnes and Noble, you pick up a book and it's either a novel or a biography or a book of poetry, and that's all it has. 
This has it all in one book. Poetry, prophetic writings, history, prose, wisdom, what we call apocalyptic literature, the certain writings about the end times. And you can break the Old Testament down into three parts that kind of group these writings together. The first is called the Torah, the Law or the Pentateuch. That's the first five books, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Deuteronomy, and Numbers. And then we have the prophets and the writings. And we're going to walk quickly through each of those three portions. So I want you to open your book and look at the book of Genesis, which is the very first book in our, in our Hebrew scripture, in our Old Testament. And just thumb through and find chapter 11. Now, you'll notice as you thumb through these chapters, and as you get to chapter 11, that these chapters contain what we call primeval or archetypal stories. They tell us the big picture stories, the story of creation, the story of the flood, the Tower of Babel. These stories date back to before recorded history, and they are stories that point always to something bigger. They tell us something about the people and the characters in them, but they also tell us important things about ourselves, about humanity. The creation story and the story of the flood have similar parallel stories that we find in ancient Near Eastern religions, and it's likely that those stories share a common source because they would have originally been oral stories shared in that whole region. But our stories, these stories differ from those because they give us a very picture of, a very different picture of God. Now, these stories aren't really meant so much to teach us about ancient history as they are to teach us about universal struggle, our universal struggle to resist temptation, our human propensity towards violence and pride. So the dating, the exact facts within these stories aren't meant to be dissected literally, but rather to give us a greater understanding of the way that God works in the world and the way that we are called to work in the world. So after the 11th chapter, we move into the history of the Israelites. You can flip through a little bit of Genesis and Exodus and look at it if you want to. We move into the story of Israelites and their unique relationship with God. We hear the story of how they are called to be God's people, the story of the covenant they will make. I will be your God. You will be my people. This is how you will live together. We hear the story of their struggle to live into that covenant and then recalling them back to that covenant over and over again. It's in these chapters that you're introduced to the important characters, right? The ones you learned about in Sunday school. Abraham and Sarah, who make a covenant with God. Their descendants, Isaac and Rebecca. Jacob, who's renamed Israel and all of his family. Joseph, who's sold into slavery, but becomes the person who saves his people from famine. It's here that we meet Moses, who 400 years after Joseph is... Um, Second to the Pharaoh, the Egyptians have forgotten all the wonderful things Joseph did for them, and so now the Israelites are slaves. Moses is called to free them. He leads them out of Egypt, and they wander the desert for 40 years. And bef right before Moses um, dies, he gets to glimpse the promised land, and then after he passes away, the Israelites get to enter. So you have just heard Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, and Joshua. So flip to find Joshua. Just flip through. Sometimes I read, I sing the song to myself so that I know. You know, like you sing the alphabet song when you're trying to remember which order. No, does anybody else do that? No? Only me. So, once the people, once the Israelites are in their promised land, we again see this cycle happen over and over again. The Israelites make this covenant with God. I will be your God. You will be my people. These are the rules you need to live by in community with me. They forget God when things are going well, when they start to get wealthy and they're, they're building their promised land. And then they begin to wander away to worship their own idols. They no longer care for what God cares for, the orphan, the poor, the widow. So God withholds God's protection. Israel's enemies overtake them. They cry out to God for help. God delivers them. We see that in Judges and Kings. And all is well again until once again they focus on wealth and pleasure and lose sight of the just community that God has called them to be. So we see in Judges, 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings, and 1st and 2nd Chronicles, that continued cycle over and over again. It's the same story with different people over and over and over again. The Israelites ask 
God to give them a king so that they can be like the other people around them who have kings. And so after kind of arguing with them about it for a while, God finally says, fine, I'll give you what you want. And he gives them kings who were meant to shepherd the people on behalf of God. But instead, those kings lead them further and further away. Finally, the northern half of the country is captured by the Assyrians in 722 BC, and the 10 tribes of Israel who inhabited that northern part of Israel are taken off and relocated all over Assyria. They intermarry with those living uh, where they are scattered and so are mostly assimilated into the Assyrian Empire. So if you've ever heard the, the lost tribes of Israel, that's where that phrase comes from because they're taken by the Assyrians and scattered all over the place. 150 years later, the same thing happens to the southern part of the kingdom. This time by the Babylonians. Jerusalem and its temple are destroyed. The people are taken into exile. Now this group refuses to be assimilated and they work hard to preserve their, nat their national identity. 50 years after the Babylonian exile, God once again delivers the Israelites from bondage. They return to the promised land. They rebuild the temple and their city walls. So now we're all the way through the history of the Israelites. You finished up Ezra, Nehemiah, and a little bit of Esther. Isn't that amazing? In just five minutes. So I want you to find Esther so you can see how much of this we've done. Through Chronicles, it's right before Job. So if you hold Genesis through Esther, you'll notice that we have gone through the first half of the Old Testament. The story, the history of the Israelites takes up the whole first half of the Hebrew Bible. It covers a period from around 2000 BC to 430 BC, all in those pages. And over and over again, we hear that same cycle happening in all of these pages. It's really the same story with different people. Theologian Albert uh, Outler says it this way. He says, it is one sweeping story of covenant making and covenant breaking over and over again. Now, let me just stop. I think it's important for us to say a word about the history books here. There are quite a few sayings about history, one being that history is written by the victors, right? But also, we know that in any story, you have multiple truths, yours, mine, and the real truth, what's in between it. And we have to remember that this is true of the history we find in the Old Testament as well. It is all written and interpreted for us at the same time. The history of Israel as told in the Old Testament is written from a certain theological and historical perspective, really multiple perspectives, as the writer of Samuel and the writer of Kings had one slant and the writer of Chronicles had another. So let me just also tell you a few words about who wrote the Old Testament. For many years, it was believed that Moses wrote the Torah, those first five books, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. But since about the 1600s, that idea has been questioned by scholars, and now most scholars don't believe that claim. And we know this for a couple of reasons. There's a few factors we can point to. First, the books never make the claim that Moses wrote them. Moses is talked about in third person. There are places where he refers to things in history that happened after he had died. And now there are some points in those scripture passages that say that Moses wrote portions of the law, and that is probably true. And then it was passed down orally until it was finally written down in the form that we have it now. But Moses did not sit down at a desk with a candle and a pen and write this narrative for us. Nor was it only one person who wrote it. The first five books have at least three authors or three groups of authors. And we know that because they use different language. The language changes as the story is told by three different groups of people. They use different titles for God and they seem to care about different things. So for example, there is one author who is particularly concerned with temple worship and you can see that slant even in sections that have nothing to do with the temple. Now, some people might think that knowing that Moses didn't write these first five books somehow takes away from the authority of the scriptures or that it somehow diminishes it, but I don't think that's true. The Torah, the story and the laws in it, 
are the defining story of Israel, the descendants of Abraham, with whom God made his covenant. They become slaves in Egypt, but God rescues them and makes them his own, and then he gives them a covenant, rules to live by as a community. This story is the foundation for the whole Old Testament, and the scripture is written to help the people know and understand the story. So it's not important who wrote it, but what the truths are that we find within it. This book has divine truths in it, but it was written and edited and passed down through human hands. So we've passed through the history books, and now we can move into what's known as the writings. So if you go right past Esther, you'll find Job. The writings also begin at Job and they end at the Song of Solomon. You can flip through and look at a few of those if you want. These, this section of what's called the writings is poetry and wisdom literature. The beginning and end of this section, Job and Song of Solomon, are both poetry. Hebrew poetry, if you don't know, has its own rhythm to it. It doesn't rhyme like Dr. Seuss, but um, kind of repeats itself in different ways over and over again. Reverend Adam Hamilton says that it's appropriate that the, this section appears in the middle or the heart of the Old Testament because these writings capture the heart and the soul of the Jewish people, both the joyful moments in life and the moments when their faith is shattered. So we start, the writings start with Job. Let me just tell you a really funny story about Job. So when Dwight was in college, um, he was a, a religious studies major just like myself, and uh, he signed up for a class that he thought was um, job because it would teach him how to get a job when he got out of college. It was Job. Had nothing to do with finding a job after college. It did teach him a lot though, right? It's one of his favorite books now. Job is an epic poem, kind of like um, Beowulf, if you remember um, reading that in English class in high school. It's an epic poem that addresses the problem of suffering. From Job, we go into the Psalms, Israel's hymn and prayer book. We read a psalm as our first scripture passage this morning. The Psalms were written all across history, Israel's history by multiple different authors, David being one of the authors. And we find within the Psalms both joyful songs of praise and lament for the bad times, for when they feel like God has forgotten them. The Psalms are followed by Proverbs, which are pithy sayings about knowledge, and then Ecclesiastes, which is mostly a depressing book, written by a wealthy man at the end of his life, his own existential angst, one might call it, coming out. I wrote my very first sermon on Ecclesiastes chapter 13, verse 1, forget not your creator in the days of your youth. It's my very first sermon and probably not a very good one. And then we end the writing section with the Song of Solomon, or the Song of Psalms, a tribute to romantic love and intimacy. Now, if you hold all of that, Job to Song of Psalms, you'll notice that it's not very big, right, compared to the history and all of the pieces that we just read before. It's a very small section of the Old Testament. And that brings us to the prophets. The prophets are organized into two groups, the major prophets and the minor prophets. Now that um, language is used not because of their importance, that one is more important than the other, but because of their length. So all of the prophets who like to write and talk a lot are linked together as the major prophets, and all of the ones who, as a friend said, can give a 10-minute sermon in five minutes are linked into the minor prophets together. And then within each of those groups, they are put together in our scriptures in roughly chronological order. Now let me just say a word about the prophets, because usually when one hears that word, people automatically think of fortune tellers, but that's not how the prophets acted or were used in biblical times. They were more like social critics. They were the ones who sounded the alarm to say, hey everyone, you are not living up to the covenant that you made with God. You are far off, and if you don't get it right soon, you're going to be destroyed. They used the word woe a lot in their prophecies. The prophets were like people holding up a mirror to those around them, continually calling the Israelites back into the covenant relationship with God. They were the ones who helped in the middle part of that cycle to help um, the Israelites repent and begin the covenant again. Now hopefully you'll remember that a few minutes ago I said that the defining story that is repeated over and over again in scripture is the Exodus. God rescuing and redeeming God's people. That's part of the cycle that we hear over and over again. But there's another story that is very significant and is one that shapes the writings found in the Hebrew Bible, especially in the prophets, and that's the Babylonian exile. If you'll remember, I said the second half of the kingdom was conquered in about 586 BC. I'm going to give you a quiz on that date in a little bit. 
They captured the Jewish king. They plundered and destroyed the temple, the temple that had stood for nearly 400 years as the sign of God's presence with them was taken down brick by brick. They were forced into shackles, made the long march to Babylon where they stayed for 50 years. Now here's how that shaped the Old Testament. First, many of the prophetic books warned about this happening. And then those written after were written in order to help the people make sense of what had just happened to them. So, for example, the prophet Jeremiah wrote before the exile, warning them that something like this would happen. The prophet Ezekiel wrote during the exile, like, hey, this is why this happened, people. And Haggai wrote after, helping them to understand what they had done wrong. Many of the Psalms are thought to come from this same time period, and even some of the historical books were, are thought to have been written by a common editor or a group of editors who wrote the history down during the exile to help make sense of Israel's destruction and to try to give the people hope as they shared with them again the story of Exodus, of God redeeming God's people from slavery. Now you can think about it this way too. Just as our country has spent the last over a decade trying to make sense of 9-11, we've written about and heard about how it has affected us as a government, as our economy, as people, as our children. We think about where we were and what happened and what has changed since then. In the same way, many scholars believe that it was during this time that the Old Testament was put together as a way to help them to fight to keep their identity, to remember their story, their defining story as, of God's people, to help them make sense of what was going on and to refocus them on their covenant with God. So if you hold one finger at the beginning of Isaiah and then one at the end of Malachi, which are... Um, I'm sorry, not Mal, yeah, at the end of Malachi, which our um, Sunday school kids can tell you is the last book in the Old Testament because we sing the song a lot. You'll see that this is a little bit bigger than the writings. If you hold the writings together with that section, which start uh, with Job, you'll see that the writings and the prophets are about the same size as the history that we went through just a few minutes ago. So taken together, these sections equal out the history from Genesis to Esther. Okay, you can close your Bible now. So here's the thing, friends. Ultimately, the Old Testament is not important just because Jesus quoted it or just because the early church thought it was important or even because it's the history of the Israelites. Ultimately, it's important because it's our history, our story. Just like whenever you sit down for a family gathering or Thanksgiving or Christmas or reunion, you end up telling the same stories over and over again, or at least my family does. We do that because they are the stories that help us to understand what it means to be a part of a family. They are stories that tell us who we are, not just as individuals, but as a group. Those are the stories of our trials and our tribulations, of our hopes and our dreams, of our joy and our pain. Those are the stories that tell us who we are and what we value. And that's really what the Old Testament is. It's our family story. Right from the very beginning when we are told we are created in God's image and out of God's profound love. We were created to receive God's love and to love God back. We chose the scriptures for this morning out of 39 books in the Old Testament because they point to just this. Our reading from Deuteronomy is an example of the call that we hear in the Hebrew Bible over and over again. The call to be God's people, to be recipients of God's love, but also to love God and God's people in thought and word and deed. It's an invitation to walk in the ways of God, to keep God's commandments, to live into the image that we were created in. God wants us to live in fellowship with God and one another. That's why God gave us rules, not so that we wouldn't measure up and could be punished, but so that we would know how to love well, how to take care of one another, to be in true fellowship and mutual relationship with God and God's people. But just like the characters in the Old Testament, we repeatedly fail to get it right. We enter that endless cycle of covenant and mess up and repentance and recovenant, and just when we think it is over, when God gives us more, just when we begin to think that God is done with us, God turns the table over and over again. God goes to great lengths to tell his people of his love, to show us God's desire for relationship. 
So this book is ultimately the story of God and God's people. It's the story of a God who will go to a great personal cost to show the people how much they are loved. It's the story of a God who loves us enough to give us the freedom to choose. And so the question for us is, what story will you choose to live into? Will you enter into the covenant that God offers, being a part of God's family, finding your story in God's story? These are the words of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let's stand together as we heard, as we respond to God's word read and proclaimed as we pray together our prayer with one voice. Holy God, we give you thanks that we are a people of story. We thank you for the Hebrew scriptures that help us to understand the ways that you work in this world that give us a vision of what you desire for us. Help us to let your word speak deeply to our hearts and begin to change us from the inside out. Help us not to hold too closely to our own understanding or interpretation, but to let our Holy Spirit inspire us. Give us new ways to understand and new hearts to live into your kingdom. Amen.